Before we dive into today's insightful discussion, I want to share some updates that will enhance your FemPower Health experience. We're excited to launch our new interactive newsletter. This weekly newsletter is packed with the latest scientific findings, business insights, and essential updates in the realm of women's health. Signing up is easy. Just visit our website or click the link in the show notes. Our website is also a comprehensive resource organized by topic for your convenience. Whether you're delving into the latest research, exploring any trends in healthcare, or seeking information in specific health topics, it's all there at your fingertips. Additionally, for our Spotify users, we've created playlists categorized by these topics, offering you another way to stay informed and engaged. And for those listening on Apple Podcasts, while we can't categorize content within the app, our website remains a central hub for all of these resources. And be sure to take advantage of these tools to stay on top of the evolving world of women's health, science, and business. Now let's get started with today's episode. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. This is FemPower Health. Each week, top women's health experts dispel fact from fiction. The most important pelvic floor exercise is not the Kegel. Challenge the status quo. It's It's never easy to challenge the accepted leaders, and especially if you're a woman. Provide perspective on why your healthcare journey may be so tough. All of that fear and worry, it all upregulates our nervous system, puts us into fight or flight mode, and increases our pain sensitivity. And what you can do about it. The number one thing is you have to advocate for yourself, and you have to be prepared. Your journey to get empowered starts now. Hello, Georgie with the Fem Power Health Podcast. In today's episode, I interview Alice Bast of Beyond Celiac in honor of Celiac Awareness Month. We do discuss celiac disease, but we also talk about the myths and facts around gluten. And as someone who's been gluten-free for nearly a decade, I know I learned a ton in this discussion with Alice. Before we dive in, a couple of quick announcements. One, do check out my show notes where I have a lot of helpful links, including related podcast episodes, resources that are discussed in the podcast, as well as a link to my Instagram account where I share information that I don't have time to share on the podcast. And of course, if you do like the episode, please do rate it and write a review because that's how we can ensure this gets at the top of people's playlists. So without further ado, let's hear from Alice where she begins by talking about her personal story. I am delighted to be here during Celiac Awareness Month to talk about my favorite subject, which is really about women's health and, and, and early diagnosis of celiac disease and treatments and a cure for the disease. So a little bit about my background is I, um, like many nonprofit leaders, I actually suffer from the disease. So I have celiac disease, but I had a harrowing journey. So um, it took me eight years going to 23 doctors before I finally had my diagnosis. And, you know, it was going from doctor to doctor. And what happened is the doctor would treat the symptom of what my, my malady. So I had migraine headaches and I was getting Imitrex for the migraine headaches. My hair was falling out. My teeth were starting to break. Many times they said it was all in my head. What really was problematic to this journey was the fact that in 1987, I had a healthy daughter and I was delighted to to have her name's Elizabeth. Three years later, I got pregnant again. And um, during that pregnancy, things went awry. Um, I started having terrible diarrhea. I kept going back to the doctor and again, they were treating the symptom, which is the diarrhea. So they kept saying, take Pepto-Bismol. And I said, I just didn't, I didn't feel right. And then I started to say the movement of the baby doesn't feel right. Like something's happening. This baby's movement is slowing down. 
And at that point in time, the doctor had said to me, ah, you know what? The baby's it's you're two weeks away from the due date. This is a seven pound baby. It seems that way, you know, go home, stop worrying. You're a worry wart. I should have trusted my instincts. And that's why this is so important to me to trust your own instincts and be empowered and speak up. Because what happened was I was suddenly felt no movement at all. And I said to my husband, um, I feel nothing. And he was like, what? And he said, he put his head down on my tummy. I'll never forget it. And he listened and there was absolutely nothing. He said, Alice, I hear no movement. I called the doctor. They rushed me into the hospital. And sure enough, I had a full-term stillborn child. She looked totally normal. Oh my God. It was Emily. She was um, almost seven pounds. I was told that it was a fluke, that they didn't know what was wrong. I continued on this journey, right? I then I ended up having three miscarriages. And again, going from doctor to doctor to doctor, trying to figure out what's going on. I was told I was healthy. I ended up uh, getting pregnant again. And this was in 1992. In the middle of that pregnancy, again, I felt this, this slowing down. I felt like things were different. I went to the doctor and they did, they put me on bed rest. They said, there is something different. You're not, it's now we know it's called intrauterine growth retardation, but the, the baby was not moving properly. So uh, they told me not to move my extremities and stay as still as possible. I did that for six weeks. I was, as you can imagine, right? I was on pins and needles the whole time, hoping and praying that I would end up having a, you know, a, a healthy baby. Again, that movement started to slow down and I ended up having a, an emergency C-section and I had a, a two pound baby girl and her name is Linnea. She's, she's now healthy, she's well, but at the time it was a wow. harrowing experience. This experience was all due to having undiagnosed celiac disease, but my journey continued. As she grew bigger and stronger and healthier, I grew weaker and weaker and weaker until I was down to uh, about 105 pounds. I'm five foot nine. And I was told I had postpartum depression. I had, well, just imagine like I am just don't have it. I'm not absorbing any nutrients. I've been through this experience where I'm losing weight. Everything that I eat is going right through me. Finally, the family veterinarian said to me, I was there for a visit and the vet said, well, you've lost so much weight. And I explained my symptoms and the vet said, well, animals sometimes have trouble with their gluten. Have the doctor test you for, and she looked it up, celiac disease. So I went back to the doctor doctor number 23 and said, Hey, and it was a gastroenterologist was a stomach doctor. Can you test me for celiac disease? And he said, you're too tall. And I said, I'm too tall. I said, I, I, you've tested, you poked and prodded me and every, and done a lot of invasive procedures. Can you please test me? And I said, what is this test? And he said, it's a blood test. I gave him my arm and said, please give me this test. He did. He tested me for celiac disease. He ran the celiac panel and sure enough, my antibodies came back high. I went in and he did something called an endoscopy, which they look at the villi in your intestine and my villi were all flattened. I couldn't absorb my nutrients. I found out that I had undiagnosed celiac disease, but I had so much resistance and so many years of misdiagnosis but I was relieved because my mom had died young of a pancreatic cancer. So I felt that I must have had, you know, some kind of cancer. We now know that undiagnosed celiac disease can lead to certain kinds of cancers, such as lymphoma and pancreatic cancer. But at the time, I really felt a sense of relief. So I started an organization years later. You know, I really I was told to go to a support group. And at the time when I joined the support group, uh, we ordered our food um, from Canada, believe it or not, and we shared the food that came in and the, the, their gluten-free food was not available. It wasn't affordable. There was no access to it. A pound of pasta cost $9.99 per, per pound of gluten-free pasta. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go back to school at night. I'm going to go back to get my degree in nonprofit executive administration and founded the organization initially to focus on early diagnosis and 
ensuring that we had safe gluten-free food, but that it was available, affordable, and that we had ha access to that gluten-free food, which is really our medicine, and spent many years doing that, the first half of the organization's life. And now our mission is to accelerate treatments and a cure for celiac disease. And, um, you know, we've made a lot of progress, but we have still have a lot of progress to make. I am really sorry for everything that you went through and so much healing must have been done over time. And hopefully a lot of it has been helped by all the work that you're doing with Beyond Celiac. I, I just can't imagine. So I have very different type of story related to gluten. So I don't think I have celiac because I haven't had the symptoms. Um, but the reason why I wanted to talk to you is not only because celiac disease is so prevalent and not understood, but I think it's this whole spectrum of understanding gluten. So in my case, I had unexplained infertility and I went to 10 of the best reproductive endocrinologists in New York city. And it was the last doctor who did, he was a reproductive immunologist, which is a questionable field mm -hmm. still in the world of infertility. And he ran all this blood work. He said that I shouldn't be eating gluten or dairy. And he said, I think you have endometriosis, but you need to get a, a laparoscopic surgery to be certain. I said, well, do I have celiacs? I think by then I had, I'd known what it was. And he said, look, we don't understand gluten. You just need to trust me. Don't ingest it. And since then, you know, it's been a decade, so much is coming out and it is kind of a fad and there's all this research and all this news. And I, I wanted to spend time with you today just to dispel myths and properly educate people on what do the studies actually say? What is celiac versus non-celiac gluten sensitivity? And just really getting the truth out there. What is celiac disease? Celiac disease is a genetic autoimmune disease and about 1% of the population has celiac disease and it's an intolerance. You really cannot eat gluten. So gluten is the protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. So when you eat gluten, it sets off an immune reaction and your body attacks itself and um, the villi in your small intestine are flattened and you can't absorb nutrients. That's celiac disease. And about when I said about 1% of the population has celiac disease, about 60% are women, right? So it's, you know, it's a disease that both men and women can have. And, you know, we recommend, you know, what I really recommend is if you think that you might have celiac disease, because it's not just a GI disease, it's actually about 40 to 50% of the people, just as you heard my story, have extra intestinal manifestations. So they can have um, neuro, you can have neurologic problems. You can have um, migraine, like we said, migraine headaches, anemia, osteoporosis. Um, there's many, many symptoms of celiac disease. And if you go to beyondceliac.org and you can download the symptom checklist and take that to the doctor and get an accurate test. And what the test is, it's a celiac panel so that you can get an accurate diagnosis of celiac disease because the treatment currently is a strict gluten-free diet. And from the minute you wake up to the time you, gotta, you go to bed, you have to worry about every bite of food that goes in your mouth. And it's really important for all the reasons I've talked about to get a, that diagnosis so that you, um, you know that you have celiac disease, you know that it's autoimmune and you can follow some of the, um, you know, the, the protocols, you know, you're gonna need to get, uh, for example, a DEXA scan to look at your bone density for osteoporosis or osteopenia. You're gonna have to look at many of the vitamins to make sure that you're, you're absorbing those vitamins and that you have the nutrients that you need to be healthy but it's also um, undiagnosed celiac disease. Many times people end up with other autoimmune diseases and you don't wanna just start a gluten-free diet. And, and as you mentioned earlier, it's a fad, you know? And, and one of the things that I am so passionate about, cause I really wanted to raise awareness of celiac disease, right? I, I, we, used to, we used to run 
these events around the country where we had thousands of people and we brought in grocery stores and we, we worked with doctors and nutritionists and, and really had medical education programs to make sure that doctors were, you know, could accurately diagnose celiac disease. But still many, many physicians say, try a gluten-free diet. If you had diabetes, you wouldn't try a little insulin to see if you feel better. It's you have to take your health into your own hands and you it's not about trying a gluten-free diet. It's really understanding what's going on with your body and so that you can be your best self. Let's talk about this path. Is it as simple as a blood test? What could be better about the diagnostics? So clearly it's because I also hear that too. It's let's see how you feel. Try a gluten-free diet. If you feel better, clearly it's gluten. That is so, so common. Like I've been told, you know, try it and see what happens. Some have said, oh, if you have a, a reaction, um, it's probably because you didn't have it for six months. And I'm like, well, if I don't have broccoli for six months, I don't have a reaction. And so you hear all these strange things between what's on media and, and what clinicians who may not be experts in this say. So let's talk about that diagnostic pathway. So first, when to get diagnosed? Because the one thing that I have found so interesting and frustrating is like for each of the different conditions, as I have capacity, I add to my website and I always write down like, what are the symptoms? You know, what are some of the current solutions? And here's some places to go to get truthful references on what you can do. And when I ever, I do the symptom checklist, I'm like, how does someone know if they have, you know, PCOS or endometriosis or thyroid disease or celiac? Because a lot of the symptoms overlap. I think it's really important to be proactive, but to get to the point of paranoia and getting tested for everything is very challenging. And again, with celiac, a lot of doctors will just say, stop gluten. So let's talk about that first. You have these symptoms. And I think on your website, it says there's 300 potential oh, yeah. symptoms. So what does one do? Like, and, and what maybe needs to change? Because the blood work exists. It sounds like it's effective. Yes. Tell me from square one, I have these symptoms. I don't know what I have. I'm going crazy. Okay. How it starts is so we talked about, that's why we have May is celiac awareness month, right? So it starts with awareness and education. So you think that you might have celiac disease. You go to beyondceliac.org. You download the symptom checklist. You take it to your doctor. You take it to your doctor, either at an annual, you know, annual physical, or if you really are having, you know, all these symptoms and insist, I don't even say ask, insist your doctor test you because it's actually a simple, the first step is a simple blood test and it's highly accurate. It is a high rate, it's, there seems to be this myth around the blood test, but the myth is incorrect that, that this blood test is a highly accurate blood test. So you'll get something called a celiac panel. And then if your antibodies are high, then the doctor will go on and um, Go, refer you to a gastroenterologist if you're with a primary care doctor, or if it's a gastroenterologist, recommend that they go in and they do and then something called this endoscopy, where they look at the villi in your intestine to confirm your diagnosis of celiac disease. That said, if you start a gluten-free diet and you're on a gluten-free diet, then you your antibodies, because you're not ingesting gluten anymore, then your antibodies, when, when you take that blood test, it will not show up that you have celiac disease because you cut the gluten out of your diet. And you're gonna have to go, you're gonna have to get something called a gluten challenge. And nobody, if you feel horrendous, like just think of, you know, your, you know, I, in my own case, cause I used to, I remember I knew every bath, bathroom in, in my office building. I knew every bathroom if I was, you know, wherever I was going, because I had, I, I had all the GI issues. I had constant diarrhea. I had the migraine headaches. I had so many symptoms of, of undiagnosed celiac disease. Um, and I, the thought of going back on gluten containing food, I couldn't, it would be so hard for me. It would be so difficult for me to do that. And actually right now we're working, um, we have a science department um, and our chief scientific officer has a daughter with celiac disease and his background is actually in endocrinology and immunology. 
And he really understands what needs to be done, what he put together a science plan to help us accelerate treatments and a cure for celiac disease. But he also understands that wouldn't it be nice to have better diagnostics? You know, wouldn't it be nice if you didn't have to go on this gluten challenge? And there's work and studies underway to have something called better biomarkers so that we, you know, that you could have, if you're on a gluten-free diet, that there would be in the future opportunity for you to, um, to minimize that uh, gluten challenge so you could get the diagnosis. That said, the first thing I always say is please don't just go on a gluten-free diet and test it out. And I know it's, it's because of the fad. Um, when I started working with major corporations, because I was working with them on ensuring that they they had their products labeled, you know, safely labeled. I was working with the FDA and the gluten-free used to be on the back of the package because it, it meant that it didn't taste any good. So they used to hide the label gluten-free and then it migrated to the front of the package. It was about marketing, right? Great for us because we could call out these gluten-free products. But what it really was is it had this health halo effect and people associated it with health, with, with beauty and weight loss. So it's all about beauty and weight loss and not about health, right? And nutrition and the fact that it is a serious genetic autoimmune disease and needs to be taken seriously so that you can live your life to the fullest and be able to eat without fear. I see wheat-free and gluten-free. What is the difference? That gluten-free is wheat-free, but wheat-free is not gluten-free. Gluten-free is free of wheat, rye, barley, and any of their derivatives. Got it. Whereas wheat-free is doesn't include barley and doesn't include uh, rye. Got it. And, and so you, if you have celiac, you need gluten-free. Wheat-free is need, not sufficient. And there are people that have a wheat allergy. So, you know, it's a different response. They do right. have, it's not an autoimmune response, but do have, you know, there are people very rarely, but they do have a, a wheat allergy. Okay. But with gluten-free diet, you have to worry about wheat, rye, barley, derivatives, cross-contamination. So if one particle of gluten is, you, you're exposed to a particle of gluten, that will set off an immune response. It's almost the same as eating a whole slice of pizza, pizza versus that little particle of gluten can set off your body attacking itself. Also, gluten hides in a lot of different products. So just think about soy sauce. You look at soy sauce, it's you turn over the label, you th think, oh, that could be made out of soy. Well, guess what? It's made out of wheat. Licorice has gluten in it. Um, there are, just think about your child playing with Play-Doh, right? What do you make Play-Doh out of? You make Play-Doh out of wheat. And then they're like playing with the Play-Doh and then they put their fingers in their mouth. We've made it so much better with the labeling, but you still have to be very, very careful to make sure that the, there, isn't the, there isn't any kind of cross-contamination. Because some of the labels, when you read it from some of the stores that say may contain traces of, and that's, you know, you look at the label and you're like, oh, do I or don't I, right? What do I do if it's going to contain traces of, you know, and I recommend that you have to, again, empower yourself, make those decisions and figure out is, you know, I sometimes you call the companies, but also um, I try not to support those companies if they have those labels that say may con contain this ingredient, because I like to support the companies that really know they go through the certification, and I can be assured that the product is gluten-free. Not to mention eating fruits and vegetables, right? I, I like to empower people. I used to be interviewed and they say, what's your favorite gluten-free product? And I'd say, I love raspberries. And they're like, no, I mean a real gluten-free product. I'm like, no, raspberries are a real gluten-free product. Don't forget that you, you have an autoimmune disease, so you might have nutritional deficiencies. And it's important, again, to get tested for all your looking at your nutritional status, because you might have a vitamin D deficiency or an iron deficiency. So it's important that you're also eating healthy foods and whole grain foods, such as, you know, brown rice, rice and quinoa, so that you're not just eating processed food. 
No, that's a great point. And, you know, again, given that it has become a fad, I, I read something where a lot of the folks that go on these gluten-free diets are gaining weight because they take the gluten-free version of a food and those tend to be more caloric and, uh, and then they're not changing their diet to be healthy. So, um, I chose the route of just eating healthier. So I hardly eat any grains. <laughs> well, you know what? Gluten-free junk food is still junk food. Yes. And like you're saying, you know, you, and you, you're glowing. I'm looking at you. You look radiant. <laughs> so Thanks. it's really important. And that's why I, even with, um, you know, with our pivot to accelerating treatments and a cure for celiac disease, you know, what we find is 30 to 50% of the people with celiac disease are, are not healing properly. So they're not abs- continuing to absorb their nutrients. So we used to think, you know, I would thought, okay, I can, I can just close down these doors. We have when, once people are diagnosed and we have, you know, access and availability and affordability to safe gluten-free food. And then we started funding studies because people would come back, including myself. I'd be traveling all over the country and around the world when we could, and I would get sick and it would, it was really hard to eat out in restaurants, right? Where, you know, where they're, where they're, you can't see what's going on in the back of the house. So for example, you'd order gluten-free pasta or vegetables. And guess what? Many restaurants reuse their water. So they bring it up to boil, they reuse that, the water and gluten is a particle. So it, it, that particle gets taken from the pasta water that's been, if they cooked pasta in the water and then they used it for vegetables. And you can then get cross-contaminated and sick from going out to eat because they reuse the water. So it's really difficult if you're eating out a lot or even um, if you're going to school or college or university, many kids with or teenagers or young adults who are going to school are choosing to a college based on being fed rather than on the program. And that never should be, that never, never, never should be. I want our community to be able to go to college and, and on based on the program and not on the ability of the cafeteria to feed that student. And that sh- that's how, why we made this pivot to accelerating treatments and a cure, because we found that um, 30 to 50% of the community wasn't, was not, you know, they're not healing. And the burden of the gluten-free diet is not, you know, not small. FemPower Health is pleased to partner with the upcoming FemTech and Consumer Innovation Summit. The summit is the latest deep dive event, part of the Women's Health Innovation Series, looking to tackle this growing sector of women's health, having had continental success in driving innovation, investment, research, and partnerships in traditional women's health care by bringing together critical stakeholders. Join us in New York on June 7th and 8th as we channel this success into the consumer sector of women's health. Visit www.femtechconsumerinnovation.com to view the superstar speaker lineup and enter code FEMPOWER15 for 15% off your ticket. Hope to see you there. Because I suffered so much, right? Because I had that whole journey. And, you know, if I think back in time where, you know, we didn't have, I didn't have the internet, right? So I actually went to a, I went to a library and collected all this information on reproductive health and celiac disease and worked with a medical librarian and got all of those, all of those studies from abroad. And um, at that point in time, um, realized that the reason that I might have had the reproductive health issues was because of the celiac disease. And I connected the dots. And then I surveyed my support group. And when I surveyed the support group, realized that, you know, there was a, an extraordinary number of women that told me that they had infertility. And I started all this collecting all this data, all this data. And then I brought it to my gastroenterologist. It was a different one. And he said, I'm going to give you a fellow. Oh my gosh, Alice, look at the study that you're doing. And, you know, I really was very involved in being my own health advocate and saying, okay, wait a second. I had this stillbirth, these miscarriages, and then all these people are coming back in these survey respondents and all this data saying, 
that there is infertility connected to undiagnosed celiac disease, went on to publish, and then, you know, then went on to start, you know, what is now called Beyond Celiac. I am truly, truly, truly a health advocate. Like I am truly empowered, you know, like fem power, just, you know, just make life better for others. You don't want others to suffer. I guess just a couple of other myths that I wanted to get through. So one is that it may not be the gluten, it could be the pesticides. And then the other is actually there's three now that I think of it. Another is the flour in Europe is different than in the U S and then the last is, Oh, there's this specific type of sourdough that those with celiac can eat. Yeah. I, I get to hear all the time about, I'll start out with the sourdough, you know, and how people say that, you know, they, they can have sourdough when, and it doesn't bother them. First of all, let me tell you that a number of people with celiac disease, a high percentage don't have apparent symptoms. So when you say it doesn't bother me, you know, um, they may not even know what their symptoms are, right? So they could be doing intestinal damage, yet they don't have symptoms. But for those that have, let's say, GI symptoms and say, oh, I, I, you know, I could eat the sourdough, you know, it's like you're a little bit pregnant, you can never be a little bit pregnant, right? You can't, unfortunately, um, you know, there's the sourdough is, is it's, it contains gluten and you should not be eating, you know, you should not be eating sourdough. Now, if they come up with uh, some more research and more data and more understanding, then that would be excellent. But um, I think, you know, what I would do is not focus on eating gluten containing products in other countries and focus on eating gluten-free products that are healthy in other countries, because yes, there is, you know, there are, we process, we more highly process the food and here in the United States. And I'm like you, Georgie, I, I actually don't eat a lot. I don't eat processed food at all. And, you know, I feel better on um, almost a grain-free diet. Um, You still cannot eat, you, you cannot and should not eat any gluten containing grains no matter what country you're in, even if it's not as highly processed. And then lastly, um, the pesticides. This is something I'm so interested in. You know, I'm really interested in pesticides and I, you know, like to be able to say, yes, it's the pesticides, you know, that, that is really causing these health problems. We need more research. Some people with celiac disease and, um, and who have other autoimmune diseases as well, we're starting to see that they don't, with, with, when it comes to toxins, they're holding in those toxins, right? And they may not. So I'm, I'm looking at some preliminary data on mold research that um, some people may, you can have a whole family that's in a, a house filled with mold, but there are some people that are affected and have um, migraine headaches and all kinds of, you know, maybe even kids' behavior issues and other people in the family that, um, that don't. And it's because there is this genetic predisposition. And um, so how the environment affects our our health, it's really personalized. But I would say, you know, there's a lot of myths out there, the myth busting with the pesticides. I've heard that so many times saying, this is is causal. We need more data in how the environment affects our health. So you can have a lot of theories and a theory of pesticides and or theory of sourdough or, but we have to bust those myths because we have to have evidence and the evidence, it doesn't support those myths right now. They're just myths. But as people report more and more information to us on Go Beyond Celiac, we can start to collect that data. And maybe there's something that will come out of it as we continue to study and we'll be able to find so that they can live a healthier life. So earlier on, I had asked you about, there's all these symptoms and it could be so many different conditions. How does one begin? So like, for example, Hashimoto's is another autoimmune condition and thyroid disease is just so many times misdiagnosed. And there's a hypothesis that many, many more people have thyroid disease than is expected. Have you all been looking at 
um, other autoimmune conditions to see if someone has celiac, what are some of the others that they tend to have? So that's the word beyond celiac. Thank you for asking. It goes beyond gluten, the gluten-free diet and beyond celiac disease to other autoimmune diseases. So there are, it's called comorbidities and there are comorbidities with celiac disease and other autoimmune diseases. One of them is thyroid disease, right? And, and thyroid disease is underdiagnosed. Another one is type one diabetes. There are shared mechanisms. And one of the things that has been intriguing to me and how I started even saying, you know what, I wanna accelerate research for treatments and a cure was that celiac disease is the only autoimmune disease with a known antigen, which is the gluten protein, which means we know when we ingest gluten, we set off that immune reaction and we know, you know, so we understand the trigger. Whereas in some of the other autoimmune diseases, they don't understand, the, they don't know what the trigger is. So in some ways we're good guinea pigs, I guess, but it's really, there's more information that can be gathered through celiac disease with these shared mechanisms of autoimmunity. And in 2015, we actually held a research summit where we brought in immunologists from other autoimmune diseases because our field has been predominantly studied by uh, gastroenterologists. And what we noticed, we needed to be a little bit disruptive and bring in some of the top immunologists. And, and because again, it's the whole body. It's not just the GI. It's not just you know seeing a neurologist or an endocrinologist. It's really looking at the total person and the total body. Dr. Miller from um, Northwestern, he started we introduced them to one of our celiac specialists and they started working together. And this top immunologist um, in the field of MS got very intrigued about how he could really create a potential, it's called a nanoparticle or a vaccine because um, he wanted to help MS patients, but he realized he could go further, farther, faster in celiac disease. So he changed his research lab to focus on celiac disease. And now that work has been, a pharmaceutical company hasn't invested in that work because of the fact there are shared mechanisms. So it's important for me, and when I think about the work that we can do in celiac disease, it's not only understanding, why did I get this disease? How did this start, right? Like, why did my child get it? How did it start? Why, why does the body go from tolerance to intolerance? And how do we bring it back to tolerance? And how do I not get all these other autoimmune diseases. And so these were the questions we were getting and we put together a scientific plan to answer those questions. Working with other really, really smart scientists from other autoimmune diseases like MS and actually in diabetes, we're working with a group of diet, you know, specialists that work with kids with diabetes. We actually um, have funded a study in England because they have something called, they have biobanks and they have large tissue samples. And the researcher there actually came from HIV. Bringing in this diverse group of scientists to, to understand these mechanisms will help us so that we, we can either intercept the disease before it starts or have you know, treatments and a cure so that we don't have to worry about, you know, we can live our lives to the fullest. You know, it, it's funny, even in, the podcast that I do. So my background is in healthcare and I've always been in the biopharmaceutical industry. And for the last decade or so, I've been a consultant. And it's been really interesting because as a consultant, you're working across so many different things and they're fast projects. And through that, I've learned that there's so many connections to things. And when you work on a lot of things at once, you really see the themes. And I'm noticing it with the podcast too because I talk about so many different topics in women's health because there are key themes, but then also for each specific thing that a woman may be going through, there are very specific answers. And so I, I love that you're doing this because collaboration really is the way to transform health because you can't really do things in silos to be effective. So if you don't mind, I do want to just touch on real quick about non-celiac gluten sensitivity and I assume this, this is something that you can speak effectively about because, you know, again, I haven't spoken to a GI specialist in, in a while, but I think even that is a little bit misunderstood. And I'm starting to see websites that 
talk about how there's just so little that's understood. So it seems like celiac is clear. Maybe people aren't great at always being proactive in diagnosing their patients, but what about the non-celiac gluten sensitivity? What would be like the one or two things that people should know about that? Or what do we know and not know? Well, first of all, there is, you're right. The research in non-celiac gluten sensitivity is about 10 years behind celiac disease. So there's so much we don't know about non-celiac gluten sensitivity. We also don't have a good test. So when I talked about get a, a celiac panel, so once the doctor tests you for celiac disease and rules it out, then they'll go on and say, well, but you might have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which means when you eat gluten, you could have the same symptoms or even worse symptoms. You don't feel well, right? Cause you wanna feel your best but yet you don't have the antibodies and you're not having the intestinal damage, but you still have the symptoms. And there needs to be greater understanding of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, but the treatment is still the same. The treatment is still a gluten-free diet. I also wanna mention though, that in addition to non-celiac gluten sensitivity, if you, again, if you go to beyondceliac.org, you can look at FODMAPs because sometimes people have a problem with FODMAPs. And there's many, many foods, you know, people start to go on elimination diets, trying to figure out where they have these intolerances. And, you know, in some of those cases, if you have an intolerance to something, or you, you can actually have a little bit of it, and there's, a, you know, you cut out the food, and then you add it in, you add it in over time. But in celiac disease, you know, because it's autoimmune, you can't do that. Okay. But with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, it's basically you go on that once you, you get tested for celiac disease, uh, you come back negative, then it's going to be, okay, let's take the gluten out of your diet and see if you feel better, right? Let's figure out what's going on. And then you're given the diagnosis of if you start to improve and your symptoms go away, you are given the, um, not, you're given the diagnosis of non-celiac gluten sensitivity but we still need to learn more about those mechanisms. And our scientists are very, very interested in non-celiac gluten sensitivity and studying it and answering the questions that we answered about celiac disease for non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I agree with the elimination diet and I've become really fascinated with food and the impacts on health. And, you know, I know uh, when we spoke about celiac, you talked about many of the, the symptoms. And I think a couple of the things also just so the women here is like stillbirth, miscarriage, chronic fatigue, early menopause, C-section, unexplained infertility, which we talked about, iron deficiency, menstrual irregularity, absence of me menstruation and osteoporosis and osteopenia. Like those are very specific to women's health. What I've become fascinated with is sometimes the symptoms are really small and we won't even notice like for example, I noticed when I eat red meat and there's another food that does it because I don't eat as much red meat anymore is my nose runs. Or if I eat gluten, I get little white dots on my forehead or I'll get phlegm in my throat. I'm always clearing my throat. And so there are these small things too. And again, not necessarily with celiac, they're a lot more severe, but you know, I guess just for those listening, when it comes to food and just impacts on your health, like all of these little things that you may think, oh, you know, I probably just didn't sleep well last night. I'm clearing my throat a lot. I mean, it could be other things as well. And so I think food in and of itself and just how we live our life is, is really important because it can have all these little things that can turn into big things if we don't take care of it. I tell people, you know what, you might want to keep a food diary and they're like, oh, I don't want to keep a food diary. But you can start to see patterns and some people, you know, if you have like lactose intolerance or, you know, there's different foods, you know, we're all, we're all different, right? And as you were saying, the gluten gave you, you know, dots on your head, gluten, my first symptom, if I get gluten, we, we call it gluten, is I actually feel like my skin's on fire, right? I get tingling all across my skin, but also some other foods, they don't, they don't agree with me as well. And that's why I started I exploring that and learning that, you know, in some cases, I actually have a, a corn intolerance too. We're, we're all different. And you start to realize what foods make me feel really good, right? I know I don't feel well on processed foods. So, you know, I may want to eat it, but then I may not feel great. It's, it's all an experiment and figure out what works for you. And the journey can be great when you start to feel amazing. Okay. So let's, let's close then. So I've got all these symptoms. I'm trying to, to get help. 
Um, you can use the checklist. So we talked about that. Go to the checklist. Don't stop the gluten yet based on the checklist. And does your checklist say like, if you have 20 of these symptoms or three of these, you should get the test. Like how would one know again, because these symptoms could mean other conditions, not necessarily celiac. So given the current state, how many of those symptoms should someone have, or is it any of them? And then they go to their doctor. It's really different. I mean, we actually need more research in the okay. area and you don't have to go rushing off, you know, just say throw in that celiac panel. Is it something that a GP can do or does it have to be a GI doctor? No, a, your, your GP can order the blood test. So, and you're actually your OBGYN can too. And I think this is important because I had a story where I tried to get a thyroid panel and my OBGYN wouldn't do it because she said I should go to an endocrinologist and I had a big debate with her and I finally got my entire panel done by her. So for anyone who has a doctor saying, I can't do it, as you just heard from the expert, they can. So just ask and push if you need to, or go find another doctor. Okay. So then they, they get the results and they have celiac. And so now I think you mentioned they do the bone density scan and the vitamin. So is the vitamin testing, is that also blood work? And should that be done at the same time or as a follow-up? They get the diagnosis of celiac disease. And then there, there's going to be um, a three month and a six month follow-up. And um, at that point in time, the, you know, typically at the six month follow-up, you'll get a whole, you'll, you should, you should ask for a nutritional panel and also um, a bone density scan just to look to make sure that you don't have osteopenia or osteoporosis. I'd also throw in that thyroid, get a thought, you know, if you're tired or having, you know, because it is a, co you know, comorbidity with celiac disease, uh, getting your thyroid tested I, is, a, you know, also a great I idea. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a pretty simple test and many women, especially in, after pregnancy or any alteration in their life, end up having a, you know, thyroid, th hypothyroidism. Yep, absolutely. And it actually also, there's an increasing rate if you're in, uh, I think, perimenopause as well. Any other tips that we haven't discussed that, or other information that you would like our audience to hear about? I would say, just say that, it, again, you know, the vitamin and the mineral deficiencies that occur when you're not absorbing, like when your villi are flattened, um, and the intestine, you know, is damaged because of the gluten exposure. And the longer that you go undiagnosed, the greater that damage. So, you know, if you can be, you know, really for us, having an early diagnosis means your villi is going to be as healthy as possible and you'll be absorbing those nutrients. So if you do have celiac in your family, because we haven't talked about that, 1% of the population has celiac disease. Believe it or not, 40% of the population, 30 to 40% of the population has the gene. Um, but the percentage, percentages of um, relatives is much higher. So if anybody in your family has celiac disease, even if you don't have symptoms, if you can catch it early on, you know, and, and like, for example, um, there's not really great guidelines in this area, but my oldest daughter does have the gene, you know, it's, it's HLA-DQ2 or HLA-DQ8. Um, when she goes in for her annual physical, she just has them throw in a celiac panel because she is a first degree relative. So we haven't talked about that, but I think it's important if you have a relative with celiac disease, you have, you know, just throw in that panel, you know, what once every couple of years to ensure that you, the, the symptom might be really small, but if you get diagnosed early on outcomes and your health status could be the nutritional deficiencies, you could lessen those nutritional deficiencies. And then last question, what is your greatest hope for women's health? I thought about this question, right? I really, you know, my greatest hope, it's really my greatest hope where I can personally be instrumental in making a difference. Um, there are, you know, I, there's reports of 50 million Americans alone who have autoimmune diseases and it's on the rise, right? Why is it on the rise? And the part that I want to play is an early and accurate diagnosis um, and ultimately treatments and options for the estimated 3.2 million Americans or the 2 million women with celiac disease. So they can live healthy lives. I say they can live their life to the fullest and eat without fear. And, you know, let's, let's figure out what we can do to to really tackle autoimmunity through celiac disease. That is perfect. Thank you. And I'm so sorry for everything that you had to go through, but honestly, 
you know, with, with a woman who's been through so much, you know, that that's the person you want on a mission to change things because you really get it and definitely have the passion to make sure others don't have to suffer. So thank you for turning your tragedies into something so amazing. And I can tell, you know, your stuff and you're doing all the right things. And I'm, I'm so lucky to have you on this episode and, and so thrilled to have met you. So thank you truly. Well, thank you truly. And thank you for this great podcast and all the work that you're doing in helping helping women. Uh, it's just, you know what, last, you know, doctors have, you know, you can't blink 15 minutes right now with your patients, right? Those primary care doctors. So you're arming us all with information so we could be our best selves. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning in to this discussion on the FemPower Health podcast. You can refer to the show notes for links to information that is referred to in this episode. And if you like this episode and found it timely and valuable, please take a moment to tell a friend or a colleague about FemPower Health. And right after this episode is over, please think of one person who might find this episode helpful and tell them about it. And if your friend is new to podcasting, please show them how to subscribe to our show. And another way to support FemPower Health Podcast is to leave a review where you listen to podcasts. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for information purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on another enlightening episode of FemPower Health. No matter where you are in your journey, our website is brimming with content tailored to your specific topic of interest or life stage. Dive in and discover the resources and insights waiting for you. Your voice matters to us. And if you found value in this episode, please take a moment to write a review. Your feedback not only helps us improve, but it also helps others discover our podcast. By spreading the word, you're empowering women everywhere with the information they need to navigate their unique unique health journeys. And if this episode resonated with you, please don't keep it a secret. Share it with friends, loved ones, or anyone you believe would benefit from the information. Together, we can create a world where every woman feels supported, informed, and empowered. Remember, knowledge is power, and FemPower Health is here to guide you and support you in every step of the way. And as a reminder, the information shared by FemPower Health is not medical advice, but for informational purposes to enable you to have more effective conversations with your doctor. Always talk to your doctor before making health-related decisions. Additionally, the views expressed by the FemPower Health podcast guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity they represent. Until next time.